Right, um, good evening everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming along tonight to hear about hidden stories of women in IWM London's new Second World War galleries. I'm a curator at IWM and I worked on the new galleries for more than five years. They opened a few months ago in October. Um, they are permanent galleries and are free to visit, so I hope you will come along and look around them at some point. So I'm going to talk to you this evening for around 25 minutes and then we will have time for some questions afterwards. Have the next slide please, Anna. So when most people think of war and conflict, particularly the Second World War, what probably first springs to mind are images of men in combat roles, firing machine guns, flying aircraft, serving on huge battleships. But in reality, such a total war as the Second World War was hugely impacted and involved women. And they should also take their place in our contemporary visualisations of this war. Because it was so total, so global and so all-encompassing, Women were affected by and drawn into it right from the outset. Total war as a concept is something that I and my fellow curators of the, the galleries at RWM London have very purposefully included in the galleries. And this concept, put simply, is that the scale, scope and reach of the Second World War was so vast that whole societies were impacted by it. Civilians were deliberately targeted and killed and huge numbers of people were mobilised. They served, worked, fought and died during and because of it. And as part of this, the role of women during the war is something that we were also very keen to highlight. This was, after all, a war in which more civilians died than did combat personnel. In fact, the total death toll of the war, around 60 million people, meant that, on average, one person died every five seconds for its duration. And women were, sadly, a major part of that figure. Huge numbers were killed as a result of aerial bombing, but also other means of destruction as battles raged across whole countries and within urban centres. Women also, in some cases, performed combat roles and auxiliary ones in the armed forces to free up men to fight, and this put them in danger. Additionally, the large-scale humanitarian crises that accompanied the war, such as hunger, disease and displacement, also cost large numbers of women their lives. Lastly, both genocide and sexual violence were perpetrated on a wide scale, in different places and at different times, and both were factors in vast numbers of women's deaths. In the new Second World War galleries, we include in the displays more than 100 people stories. These are individuals from over 30 different countries. They are women, men and children, soldiers and civilians, and they are many different types of people, who had wide-ranging experiences of the war. These stories help our visitors to understand the scale of the conflict and how larger events impacted people on a personal level. Nearly 40 of these stories are women's. They include an American spy, a member of the French resistance, a Soviet sniper, munitions workers, war artists, a member of the Indian National Army, a British grandmother who died in the Blitz, a Polish woman who fought in the Warsaw Uprising, a German woman murdered in Auschwitz, and a Ukrainian woman who risked her life under Nazi occupation. This evening, I'm going to talk to you about some of these incredible women and tell you their stories. And I'm starting here in Britain in the summer of 1940, when the persistent German aerial attacks of the Battle of Britain placed those involved in Britain's defence in huge danger. This was a time when some incredible feats of bravery were carried out and later rewarded. In November 1940, Three women, shown here, of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the WAF, were awarded 50% of all the military medals received by members of that service during the Second World War. They were stationed at RAF Biggin Hill in Kent, which suffered some of the worst air raids during the Battle of Britain. In a devastating attack in late August, 39 people were killed. The next morning, those who had survived reported for duty as usual, at the start of a day that would see further air raids. Sergeant Jane Mortimer was one of them. She was a WAF teleprinter operator at Biggin Hill, who, along with two other women in the same role, stayed at her post during further heavy attacks from the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. Joan was in the armoury when the air raid started. Although she was surrounded by several tonnes of high explosive, she remained at her telephone switchboard, relaying important messages to the de defence posts around the airfield. Joan then picked up a bundle of red flags and hurried out, to mark the numerous unexploded bombs scattered around the area. Even when one detonated close by her, she carried on. And for her bravery and her determination to carry out her duties during such danger, 
she was awarded the military medal that is on display in the Second World War galleries. <laughs> there we go. In July 1940, the British established a secret organisation to work against the Germans in occupied Europe. It was called the Special Operations Executive, or SOE, and it was told by Winston Churchill to set Europe ablaze. SOE recruited, trained and armed special agents and sent them to work with resistance groups, carry out sabotage and conduct espionage. Operating behind the lines in German-occupied Europe was extremely dangerous. Many captured agents were tortured and executed. Unusually for wartime Britain, women were allowed to serve in an unequal, an unequal capacity rather, as men, and women agents underwent the same training as their male counterparts. In total, 39 women were sent by SOE to operate in France, one of whom was an American named Virginia Hall. She worked undercover for SOE in the city of Lyon. As with other agents, she underwent intense training, uh, including weapons handling, unarmed combat and the use of explosives. She was then given a mission and provided with a fake identity and we have her fake ID card on display in the galleries and it shows that she pretended to be a journalist. This was all part of her disguise to help her go unnoticed in German-occupied France. Virginia was brave and resourceful. She helped many other secret agents as well as allied prisoners of war and airmen who had been shot down to escape the Germans. She became so successful at this that the German secret police issued wanted posters for her. And these read, the enemy's most dangerous spy, we must find and destroy her. Virginia had lost her lower left leg in an accident before the war, and the Germans nicknamed her the Limping Lady. Despite some close calls, she somehow managed to evade capture. After 15 months operating in France, Virginia returned to Britain during a daring escape in which she crossed the Pyrenees Mountains. She was lucky, and in fact, of the 39 women SOE agents who went to France, 13 did not survive. France was, of course, just one of many countries that fell to invading German forces during the war, and living under a Nazi regime meant that people across the continent often had to choose whether they would resist, collaborate, or tolerate their occupiers. One person who found a way, a way to resist German rule was a young Ukrainian woman named Nina Herasimova. Nina was a student living in the centre of Kiev when German forces attacked Ukraine. Nina's husband and her brother both went off to fight at the front when the German invasion began. She then witnessed some of the intense fighting that took place as Kiev was surrounded and then fell to the invading forces in September 1941. Not long after this, Nina befriended an elderly Jewish couple named Philip and Maria Grinberg. Philip was a lawyer and they lived not too far from Nina's home. Of course, at the heart of German policy across Europe was the Nazi obsession with ridding Europe of its Jewish problem. In Ukraine, the occupying German forces wasted no time and they soon began to round up Kiev's Jewish population. But Nina helped to keep Philip and Maria from being found and taken away. And at great personal risk, she let them live in her apartment, which she shared with her mother, Alexandra. In doing this, Nina knowingly risked her life to keep the Grinberg safe from the mass killings that took place at Babi Yar, also known as Babin Yar, which was a ravine in Kiev where the Germans murdered over 30,000 people in late September 1941. In total, an estimated 1.5 million Jewish people from Ukraine were killed in the Holocaust. After the war, Nina and her mother were both honoured for their actions, and they were counted among the righteous of Ukraine. Another woman who chose to resist the Germans was Lucille Hollingdale. Lucille was born in France in 1895 and married a British man named Henry Hollingdale in 1921. They lived in northern France, not far from Calais. When France fell to the Germans in June 1940, they, like millions um, of other French people, found themselves living under enemy occupation. From the outset, Lucille and Henry were opposed to the Germans. They even kept a picture of Churchill in their home in defiance. And they began their resistance activities within weeks of France's surrender. They did so by assisting Allied airmen who were shot down in the area near where they lived. Lucille began to cycle for miles around the local area every day, searching for airmen who needed help. She took clothes and food with them for them, with with her in the bicycle basket there, um, 
and that's um, in IWM's collections. Lucille fully knew that she was taking a huge risk um, in doing this, because if she had been caught by the Germans helping Allied airmen, she would have been arrested. But she later said that she was ready to give her life to save the airmen's lives, and that she used to leave in the morning not knowing whether she would return at night. Lucille also passed on useful information um, about the Germans that the airmen then took back to Britain with them. Between them, Henry and Lucille helped between 200 and 250 British and American airmen who were shot down. Joining the resistance carried the risk of being informed on by people who were your neighbours, colleagues, even friends or family. This was usually out of fear, perhaps of what the occupying forces would do to someone who had known about resistance activity but hadn't reported it. And in 1943, this is exactly what happened to Lucille. She had confided in a woman who she knew well, that she had been working to help downed airmen. And this woman passed on that information to the Nazi secret police, the Gestapo, who went to Lucille and Henry's home and arrested them. Henry was very badly beaten by Gestapo officers until he was unconscious. Lucille was then taken away and she never saw her husband again. She later learned that he never recovered from being beaten like that and that he died in hospital six months later. After her arrest, Lucille was held in 15 different prison camps, including Belzen and Buchenwald, and she was tortured by the Gestapo for information. But Lucille told them nothing, and she didn't betray any of her fellow resistance members, despite being beaten and her toenails being extracted. She later said that she had been prepared to die without betraying anybody. Lucille was condemned to death, but this wasn't carried out, and she managed to survive the war and to return home. However, her health was forever affected by her time being tortured in the camps. She was awarded the British Empire Medal and the American Medal of Freedom for her bravery. The French resistance is a fairly enduring image of wartime France, and there were, of course, many others who joined Lucille in resisting the Germans there. But it's important to remember that, as elsewhere in Europe, the proportion of the population that resisted was only ever a very small minority. Most people, in fact, tried to carry on their lives as normally as possible. So as well as German occupation of large, part, large parts of Europe, during the war many millions of people endured li years of living under Japanese rule in areas of East Asia and the Pacific that Japan invaded and occupied. One of those people was Juliana Young. She lived in the Philippines, which had been under US influence up until the Japanese conquered it in May 1942. Juliana was married to Clarence Young, who was a diplomat. He was China's consul general to the Philippines. They had three children and they lived in a large house in the capital, Manila. Clarence had been sent there to raise funds for China's continuing war against Japan, and he did so pretty successfully. He was able to raise money for the war effort from the Chinese community that lived in Manila. When the Japanese invaded, they arrested Clarence and took him away. Juliana visited him in prison, but after a while he disappeared and she never saw him again. She only discovered after the war that he had been executed by the Japanese. As Manila fell under Japanese control, other members of the Chinese diplomatic community had their property confiscated, and many ended up being taken in by Juliana. In total, she looked after a household of 26 people, including her children, all the while not knowing what had happened to her husband. Due to the wartime conditions and the Japanese occupation, Juliana and the rest of her household struggled to find enough to eat and to get hold of other essential supplies. They ran short of money and found it really difficult to buy food. Juliana also felt the strain of responsibility for so many people, all while living under oppressive Japanese rule. But they got by, they grew vegetables and had chickens and made their own clothes. They had to make do with what they had or could get hold of. And together, they got through the years of occupation. Juliana and her three daughters survived the war. She later married again, worked for the United Nations in New York, and lived to the age of 111, releasing her autobiography, aged 110. The war brought devastation to Italy and its people. While Allied and Axis armies battled each other, rival Italian groups fought a vicious war of their own from autumn 1943 to spring 1945. This bitter civil war raged between fascist forces who supported Mussolini and pro-Allied anti-fascist resistance groups known as partisans. For nearly two years, the whole country became a battleground. Almost all Italians were affected as fighting erupted around them. 
Civilians' homes were requisitioned, plundered and destroyed as the various armies moved through the country. This was how Rosa Babini experienced the war. She lived with her family in Faenza in the Emilia Romana region of northern Italy, an area which was devastated by the fighting. Rosa lived with her parents, Carlo Babini and Celeste Zolle, and her siblings, shown here. At the end of 1944, German troops invaded their home. They took over the bedrooms and made Rosa and her family sleep on the floor downstairs. The soldiers seized the majority of the food and left the family with very little to eat. Rosa's mother, Celeste, used this dish to make cheese in um, when there was any milk to spare after milking the cows. And that small cheese dish is on display in the galleries, alongside the photograph of the family outside their home. The family had also hidden a pig in a nearby um, field, but the Germans found it and killed it for themselves. During heavy bombardments, they, they hid in a haystack to remain safe. The, the war years were tough for Rosa and her family, as they were for countless others across Italy, who were caught up in the fighting. They managed to get by and to survive the war, although there wasn't a complete return to normal after the fighting stopped. In Italy, as elsewhere, there were shortages still of food, supplies and other essentials, as well as instances of reprisals and other violence carried out against those who had been on the wrong side during the war. Rosa is still alive and living in near Faenza, and her daughter, who I know through my father, very kindly brought the dish to London for display, um, as well as the photograph and details of her mother's story. And it all forms part of the section of the galleries where we look at the war in Italy. Next, please. Women across the world were mobilised for the war effort. Their labour kept war indust key industries going and supplied the armed forces. From December 1941, Britain conscripted women to join the war effort. Unmarried women under 30 had to join the armed forces or work on the land or in industry. By 1943, women up to the age of 50 could be mobilised into work. For many women, this meant they could take on roles that they previously wouldn't have been able to. Many women gained new skills and higher incomes, but there was also gender inequality, especially as women received lower pay than men for the same work. There was also another element of discrimination in wartime Britain. Lillian Barder was from Liverpool, and she applied to join the Navy, Army and Air Force Institute, and she worked briefly in its canteen at Catterick Camp in Yorkshire. Her father was from Barbados and her mother was Irish, and this had caused difficulties for Lillian in trying to gain employment before the war. This discrimination now continued, and she was dismissed from her post because of her West Indian heritage. Lillian gave up hope of doing her bit until she heard on the radio that the Royal Air Force, the RAF, was accepting West Indian recruits. So in March 1941, Lillian enlisted in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force and soon became one of the first women to qualify as an RAF instrument repairer. She worked long hours checking aircraft instruments and was soon promoted. And after the war, Lillian gained a degree and became a teacher. Another woman's story that we feature in the Second World War galleries also features in the new Holocaust galleries that are directly above them. Her name was Clara Vollm, and she and her husband Leonhard moved from northeast Germany to Berlin in January 1938. They had four daughters, Ilse, Kate, Eva and Ursula, known as Uli. Clara had been a school teacher and was interested and very involved in women's politics. As anti-Semitism in Nazi Germany intensified, Clara and Leonhard desperately tried to get their children to safety abroad. Ilse left for South America in 1937, Eva and Uli escaped to Britain on a kinder transport in 1938, and Kate followed them to Britain as a domestic servant in 1939. Clara had worked hard to secure Eva and Uli's place on the kinder transport, but through her influence with the Jewish women's organisation that she was a member of. And she also made sure that the sisters were able to stay together and go to the same country. Clara and Leonhard tried to lead Germany too, but each attempt failed, and they became increasingly desperate as they spent more of their savings trying to leave and had to keep moving to different addresses in Berlin. In 1941, Clara wrote, money gone and hope buried, and we don't know what will happen. In February 1943, both Clara and Leonhard were deported from Berlin to Auschwitz-Birkenau, where they were murdered. The family had managed to sporadically communicate with each other during their time apart, via the Red Cross. And we have on display in the Second World War galleries the last exchange of telegrams between Eva and her father, Leonhard. 
And in the Holocaust galleries, there are further objects linked to the family's attempts to leave Germany as the threat to Jewish people there intensified. Their daughters managed to survive the war and settle in her families in Britain. And it is through Clara and Leonard's descendants that the museum has been able to tell and preserve their story. So far, we've really learned a lot about women who remained civilians during the war, although there have been those who risked their lives and experienced danger. But I want to talk now about one of the women who took up arms and fought. During the war, the most intense mobilisation of society took place in the Soviet Union. All citizens, even teenagers and political prisoners, had to work or fight, and they experienced harsh conditions. Women provided 80% of the farming workforce and 50%, 57% of factory workers. In total, more than 34 million people served in the wartime Soviet armed forces. One million of these were women, half of whom fought in the front line. One such combatant was Ludmila Pavlichenko. Born near Kiev in 1916, she was interested in history and wanted to become a teacher. But when Germany invaded the Soviet Union, she abandoned her university studies to join the Soviet Red Army. Ludmila rejected the army recruitment officer's suggestion that she become a nurse and instead she joined the infantry and became one of the Red Army's first female snipers. As a teenager, she had enrolled in a sharpshooter class and later she took on um, courses at sniper school. She soon proved her shooting skills in combat and was enrolled in the 25th Rifle Division as a sniper. Her reputation earned her the nickname Lady Death. By mid-1942, Ludmilla was credited with killing 309 enemy soldiers making her the most successful woman sniper in history. The German army once sent her a message stating, if we catch you, we will tear you into 309 pieces and scatter them to the winds. In response, Ludmilla just said that she was pleased to learn that they accurately knew her, her record. <laughs> in June 1942, Ludmilla was wounded in the face by shrapnel. She was removed from combat and instead the high, Soviet high command decided to give her a new role in drumming up support for the Soviet Union. Ludmilla was sent on a propaganda tour of the US, Canada and Britain. In America, she became the first Soviet citizen to visit the White House when she met President Roosevelt. And she even inspired a song by folk singer Woody Guthrie called Miss Pavlichenko. We have on display in the galleries this British propaganda book which features Ludmilla on the cover. During a speaking tour across America, um, encouraging support for the Allied uh, cause, the US press focused on what she was wearing and her lack of makeup rather than her achievements. But Ludmilla just said, who has time to think of her shiny nose when there is a battle going on? And her speeches were popular with American audiences. Returning to the Soviet Union, Ludmilla was promoted to major and given numerous awards, including the Order of Lenin, twice. She then trained snipers for the Red Army and later completed her university studies and became a historian. To this day, she's remembered as a military hero. So in conclusion, I think that these stories demonstrate not only the extent to which women were affected by the Second World War, but also how diverse their roles and experiences were. In many countries, the auxiliary roles carried out by women, as well as their war work in munitions, agriculture, healthcare, and other industries, was integral to their nation's ability to stay in the war and keep fighting. As I've explained, women also served as secret agents, joined resistance and partisan networks, kept vulnerable people safe under enemy occupation, and even in some cases fought in the front line. Their roles were varied and often required a strength of character and a determination under intense and extreme circumstances that should not be underestimated or forgotten. It is worth remembering, however, that although we have heard stories of women's bravery and successes this evening, for many, in fact most women, during the war, their stories were ones of hardship and deprivation. The majority of them did not take up arms or become secret agents. Those exciting stories are the ones we know most about. But there were many millions more lived experiences of women across the world who found their lives disrupted and negatively impacted, and who carried on as best they could and found ways to cope. It's also true to say that there were those who were unable to resist their fate, Women such as Lucille Hollingdale, who was captured and tortured, Rosa Babini, who could do very little about the German soldiers who occupied her family's home, and of course Clara Voll, who desperately tried to escape Germany, but who was eventually deported to Auschwitz. 
As we've seen, these women's stories intersect with other aspects of the war and with the perhaps more recognisable and talked about roles that men had during it. Through these women's stories, we've encountered the airmen of the Battle of Britain, Allied prisoners of war and downed airmen in German-occupied France, those targeted by Nazism, Nazism's attempted annihilation of Europe's Jews, and the soldiers of multinational armies fighting in Eastern Europe, in Italy and in East Asia. In this way, we can see that women's wartime experiences didn't ex exist separately to the wider conflict. They were very much part of it, wrapped up within this global, total war. Put simply, in a conflict that blurred the lines between soldier and civilian, it is essential to learn about women's lives during the war in order to truly understand it as a whole. I'm not trying to assert that women's roles in the war were more important than men's, or that they are more deserving of recognition. It's just that as an historian, I do know that the best way to understand this conflict is to learn about as many different people's experiences of it as possible. And as part of that, it is absolutely worth discovering and remembering what happened to women and what they did during the war. Today, the legacy of women's experiences in the Second World War is something that can still be felt around the world. The vast majority of us here today have family links to the war, such was its nature. Both of my grandmother's lives were affected by the Second World War, as were the lives, of course, of their contemporaries. As for so many others, it interrupted my grandmother's lives and their plans, and altered the course their lives took. They are both shown here in these photographs, which, incidentally, I have managed to get into the galleries. <laughs> both of them undertook war work, one as a land girl and the other in an aircraft factory. Both also met their husbands during the war, and really because of it, and they went on to build their lives with them after it ended. And there were many other wartime romances. So, even during such undoubtedly dark times, there were still ways in which people found to keep on living and to look ahead to better times, to a time of peace. Amidst such death, many were inspired not only to survive, but to really live. There are countless stories from the war of women's resilience, bravery, compassion and hope. And I think that the stories of the women I've told you about today are testament to all of that. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions anyone might have. <laughs> no? <laughs> Covered everything. <laughs> I'm just um, amazed at just how many, and like you, I have a mission to keep women's stories alive. I mean, that's... I just feel the same way. But, you know, I, I thought I'd start, because I'm going to be doing this one later on in the, in the, um, in the month, yeah, um, I too have found, tried to find everything I could in order to be able to make the show. And um, it was jolly difficult. <laughs> because, I mean, they just weren't chronicled. That's the, that's the problem with women's history. It just isn't chronicled um, mm. by and large. And, you know, and I can understand it in a way because, I mean, if you think of it, uh, I'm sure you're, you're grandparents probably the same. I mean, if I asked my grandmother, you know, I mean, I tried to take her, she wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, she said, oh, everybody, everybody did that. You know, I mean, she just never thought for a second that, you know, she might have done something remarkable, but she had. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, I agree with you that we don't understand a war or any part of history, really, if we don't know what the women did. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often sort of feel, well, Hitler wouldn't have bothered if he'd encountered my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and these women too. I mean, and yet a lot of it was very much mundane and just what we did and what we mm. got on with. Yeah. And yet you you've mentioned all of these women, hardly any of whom I've ever heard of before. Yeah. And we, we discovered quite yeah. a few of those stories new for the galleries, but I did have to go out and look for them and find them. Yeah. And when I got them, they'd say, "Oh, well, why do you want to know about that? My, my life wasn't interesting." Because it was. We want to know. Yes, we want to was. know. <laughs> Because they were just a civilian, they don't think of what yes. they did as important or glamorous in any way. And it doesn't have to be, it just has to be told and remembered, because that's yeah, how you fit yeah. the whole picture, isn't it? But yeah, yes. we, did, we did encounter a few people saying, OK, well, you can have, you can have my photo if you want, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah it's so great to find them. So have any friends or, or members of your family that you know these stories have got to be somehow kept contact either of us. I mean, I'm actually go about to do a web series on these women. You know, I'd like to interview them if, if they would agree. If not, you know, if they're not alive anymore or not wanting to be on, on camera, I'm happy to 
interview their ancestors, but it's just not ancestors of descendants. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we've got to right. get these with the stories before we go because you know they're, they're, they're leaving us very soon now. Yeah, exactly. We've lost too many as it is. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. We Thank might you. become one of these women. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. I'm turned>. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you'll add any more to the collection? Oh, hopefully, yeah. I think and hope that the galleries might prompt people to do that. I think when they see the types of stories we have in there, that we do have ordinary people. It's not, you might think it's a war museum, it's just going to be the soldiers, sailors, airmen. So many different variety of people there, and also from across the world, we're really keen to have as many global stories as we can. Um, because, you know, that's what we want to talk about. If there's a world war, we've got to tell that world story. And I think it's prompting people to, to look into what they have and get in touch with us and offer us things. So, yeah, I've definitely seen the amount of emails go up in that direction. So, um, yeah, it, yeah, we'd love to collect new stories and, and get as many experiences as we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.